Golden State Media Concepts Baseball Podcast. We cover everything major league from spring training to the World Series. We've got your favorite club covered from New York to Boston to L.A. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Baseball Podcast. Welcome back to the GSMC Baseball Podcast. But first, you guys got to take a look at this real fast. Take a look at this. Ready? I'll play this clip for you. Ready? Check this out. Two balls, two strikes. Oh, he struck him out. <laughs> look at Rizzo. He can't believe it. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> probably wondering like what that was all about well what happened was anthony rizzo struck out freddie freeman (laughs) yeah you heard that right uh so the cubs were just getting their butts kicked in the game recently last night and um the cubbies put in anthony rizzo just to pitch an inning and he struck out the reigning nl mvp so here's that story okay here's that story uh, I'm, I'll be doing recaps today, uh, recaps of each game, each situation, what happened, and go over each one. And if you're down for it, then so am I. Let's get to it. So, this is between the uh, Cubs and the Braves. So, we go to the box score, we open up the box score. Let me do that real fast. Un momento. All right, I see it now. So, starting for the game for the Cubbies was uh, Kyle Hendricks, who ordinarily is a good pitcher. <laughs> That sounds ominous, right? <laughs> Ordinarily, he's fine, but today, he sucked. <laughs> and pitching for the uh, Braves was Huascar Genoa. Uh, he's a native of the Dominican Republic, Puerto Plata. Good for him. He's 22 years old. Young guy, 22 years old. And uh, let me let me look at this. So the, the Cubbies had a few uh, no players on their roster. They, of, cor- they of course, had uh, Rizzo. On their team. And Rizzo, of course, the first baseman. Uh, he went one for four. You know, I'll save that for later. They had catching Wilson Contreras. They had Tony Walters coming as defensive replacement. Matt Duffy coming in later. Chris Bryant playing left field. Jason Hayward playing right field. Ian Happ pinch hitting. David Bodie playing second base and third base. Jake Marisnik playing center field. Nico Horner playing shortstop. Kyle Hendricks pitching, and Alec Mills relieving him eventually. For the Braves, they had Ronald Acuna Jr. Uh, in right field, Freddie Freeman at first base. Uh, they had an, a guy named Dayton. I believe it's Grant Dayton, yep, uh, pitching at some point. From Huntsville, Alabama, good for him. They had uh, Marcelo Ozuna playing left field. Ozzy Albias playing second base. Dansby Swanson playing shortstop. Austin Riley playing third base. Guillermo Heredia playing uh, center field. Austin Jackson playing catcher. And that's it. So, you guys want to hear play by play? All right, let's do it. So, let me see. So, the Cubbies uh, have added first. Uh, Huascar, you know, is pitching for Atlanta. So, it was a game at the Turner Field for the Braves. So, you know, I struck out Anthony Rizzo swinging on a slider Low and inside, good for him. 86 miles an hour, one out. Then, Contreras flies it to right field on a forcing fastball, low and away. Two outs. You know what pitches, seven pitches to Matt Duffy and walks him. Okay. And then, he strikes out Chris Bryant swinging on a slider, low and away. Excellent job. Ball in first inning, ball in the first inning. Acuna Jr. flies out to center field against uh, Kyle Hendricks. A fly-out sinker, 86 miles an hour. Then, Freddie Freeman singles the left field off a change-up, low and inside. 81, 
Change up. He crushes at the left field. Uh, there it is, right? It's runner first base. We're runner first base. Uh, Marcelo Ozuna hits a home run off a Kyle Hendricks curveball. Hendricks hung a breaking ball right down the middle, 72 miles an hour, nothing on it. And Ozuna hits a 455-foot blast to left field, driving in Freeman, 2 to nothing, Atlanta. Then, Albias doubles uh, to, to deep right field, follows up with a double. Uh, lone inside changeup crushes that. So, Hendricks, at this point, has given up two runs, and Albias at second base, and there's only one out. Swanson hits a line drive to the shortstop for out number two. And then, my pal Austin Riley, who looks so bad against my Diamondbacks, poor thing, hits a home run to left field off a changeup. It's 370 feet, drives in Albias, scores 4 nothing. The Cubbies, in their top second inning, they do nothing, really. Uh, well, I, sh- I should be fair. Marisnik hits a triple. Jake Marisnik, the left fielder, hits a triple to deep right field off a fastball. You know what throws 97 miles an hour? Low nut side fastball. Marisnik triples to deep right field, and that's that. Uh, but Horner grounds out to Cannon Vansom, so that's... Uh, a clean inning, basically, for, you know, a bum second inning. Austin Jackson, I guess he's catching? I'm not sure. Strikes out looking off a sinker. Uh, you know what, the pitcher singles to right field. First pitch swinging, crushes a single to right field. And that's uh, good news for him. Acuna Jr., after that, follows it up with a single to left field. You know, goes to second base. Freeman doubles the center field, drives in both Acuna and Yanoa. Six to nothing, Atlanta Braves. And top third inning Cubbies do nothing again. Rizzo singles center field. So does Matt Duffy, but nothing really happens uh, for the Cubs. They don't score a run. Bomb of third, Braves do nothing either. Top of fourth, Cubs do nothing. Bomb of fourth, Braves up again. And the pitcher, Huascar Yanoa, hits a home run to left field, 397 feet off a curveball. When a pitcher hits a curveball, for a 400-foot blast off you and pulls it, that's really bad. And by the way, Hendricks is still in the game. He's given up seven earned runs, has pitched three complete innings, and there's, he's still in the game. I mean, that's just like, wow. So then Acuna Jr. grabs a third base, Freeman singles to left field, Acuna flies out, albeit singles again, and now they finally pull Hendricks and put in Alec Mills. Swanson hits a line drive center field for an out. Braves are still up 7 0. So then, uh, the Braves, no, Cubs do nothing again. Braves are back in the bottom fifth inning. Riley hits a double to deep right field. Then Heredia hits another double, driving in Riley. And that's that for that inning. Uh, in the bottom sixth inning, it goes out saying this point the Cubs haven't done anything yet. Ian Haps in right field. Alec Mills is still pitching. Freeman. Uh, I believe he's third pitch swinging, gets a 63 mile an hour curveball from Alec Mills, crushes a home run to right field, 379 feet. Ozuna grounds out, and Albias basically goes back. He hits a home run to right field off a fastball, 89 miles an hour, low and outside, golfs it for a home run to right field, 390 feet. Swans, uh, Dansby Swans strikes out swinging. Swans had a tough game today so far. And that's that for the. Uh, I believe it's, yeah, for the Braves. <laughs> I, I remind myself what team was winning the game. Uh, 10 to nothing, Braves up. And then, uh, at this point, that's when it gets ridiculous. So, I'm trying to figure out like, when they put in Rizzo to the pitch. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, bomb of seventh inning. Bomb of seventh inning. So, Rizzo's pitching. They put in Duffy at first base, Bodie at third base, Sogard at second, and. Uh, Carmago is batting. He's replacing uh, Luke Jackson, the pitcher. And Rizzo gets Carmago to ground out to first base to Matt Duffy, one out. Then he walks Acuna on five pitches, his fastball topping out at 71 miles an hour, throwing some heat. And then, unbelievably, Rizzo strikes out Freddie Freeman. And that's the clip I showed you again, so let's listen to that one more time. Balls, two strikes. He struck him out. <laughs> Look at Rizzo. He can't believe it. 
So Freeman and Rizzo are laughing at each other, and here's what it looks like. So, um, <laughs> so first pitch, he throws a curveball, 61 miles an hour, a ball, it's just outside. Uh, then he throws a fastball for a ball, although it almost catches the corner at 70 miles an hour. Then Rizzo dumps strikes in there at 70 miles an hour, high and outside for a strike. Then Freeman fouls a ball off at 73, up in the zone. And then Rizzo changes speed and throws like a, a curveball, a slurve. It's 61 miles an hour. It's got nothing on it. And Freeman swings over the top of it. Faust tips it back into the catch mitt. Everybody just bursts out laughing. It's just the funniest thing. <laughs> lefty on lefty. It's just, that's just amazing. After that bat, they find, they take Rizzo out at the peak of his game. And they put in Matt Duffy to replace him at the mound. And Duffy then grounds Ozuna out. That's where the game basically ends for both clubs. Cubs lose the game, obviously. The Braves win 10 to nothing. Now, the Cubs are 10 to 14. The Braves are 12 and 12, and that's the standing. Let's talk about the standings, actually. I should have done that earlier. So, here are the global standings for all the teams in Major League Baseball. You ready? So, leading off in the American League uh, East, the Red Sox are leading the division, and they're actually the best team right now in. in uh, I was going to say baseball, but they're tied for the Dodgers. Yep, the Red Sox are the best team in their division. So, like last week or so, I was saying the Red Sox were doing poorly, but they've come back. They're now 16-9. 16-9. They've got a plus 22 run differential. They've won three games in a row. They're 6-4 and four for the last 10 games. The Red Sox are off to a good start. Next up is the Tampa Bay Rays. They're now 13-12. and 12. They're three games back. 93 differential, streak of two games, one, six and four last game. But Blue Jays are now 11 and 12, four games back, plus nine run differential, five and five last 10. The Yankees, the Yankees are 11 and 13, 4.5 games back. They have a plus one run differential. They've won their last two games. The Orioles are 10 and 14. They're five games back uh, behind the Red Sox. They are three and ten at home, so they're not doing well at home. They've done better on the road, seven to four on the road. Their differential is negative fifteen. That's really bad. Losing streak of two games. And the Central, the AL Central, the Royals are fifteen and eight. They have a differential of plus six. They have a streak of one game, uh, one. They're seven and ten on their last ten games. Uh, the White Sox are second. They're twelve and ten. 2.5 games back. They're plus 18 differential. They've lost their most recent game. That's fine. We still like them. The Indians are 11 and 12. They've they're four games back. Differential negative three. And lost their last their last game. The the Twins are 8 and 15. The Twins are 8 and 15. They're seven games back. They're they got differential negative six. That's pretty ugly. Two and eight over the last ten games. And hold on to your hats. The Tigers are 8 and 16. That has to be the worst record in baseball. Yep, it is. So um the Tigers are 8 and 16. They have percentage of 0.333 for winning. 7.5 games back. Negative 35 differential. Which indicates that they are allowing so many more runs in their scoring. That's really bad. 2 and 8 over the last 10 games. In the West, the Oakland Athletics are 15 and 10. They have differential negative four, losing streak of two games. The uh, last 10 games are seven and three. The Astros are 13 and 11, 1.5 games back of the uh, of the division leader, plus 25 run differential, plus 25. That's pretty good. You can you can live with a team that's plus 25 because that means they're going to score more runs if they're on a good uh, streak. You can live with that. You can work with that. Um, then the uh, Angels are 12 and 11. Good for them. <laughs> their differential is negative 16, though. So, and they're two games back of a division leader, so who knows. I really want to see Mike Trout at some point in my life get into the playoffs. He deserves it. But who knows, right? But yeah, so Mike Trout, if he can get to the playoffs, that would be good for him. 
Otani is leading the big leagues in home runs. Trout is doing great. Uh, Upton is getting Upton and Pools are finding their youth again. I hope their pitching can stay stable because the uh, Angels are a great team, and I really hope Trout can get the playoffs again. The Mariners are thirteen and twelve, which is shocking because like last week they were you know the best, and now they're falling down a little bit. Two games back of a leader, differential negative three. Last four games they've lost, losing streak of four straight games. Um, the Rangers are ten and fifteen. Uh, five games back, they're negative nineteen runs in the hole, and they've lost the most recent game. Now in the NL, the National League, the Phillies are twelve and twelve, playing five hundred ball, differential of negative fifteen, which is in great. They're playing even their five and five of the last ten games, which is okay. It's not spectacular. Uh, the Braves are also twelve and twelve. They are playing five hundred ball, plus four differential. They've won three games in a row, though. They're on the up and up. The Mets, the hapless Mets, are nine and ten, half a game back of a division leader. Yeah, I got to say, like the NL East is probably the weakest division in baseball right now. The Mets are half a game back. They have a differential of negative thirteen. They've lost two straight games. Last ten games, they're three and seven. Not good. Marlins are eleven thirteen, and I like the Marlins. I like the Marlins. I think they're they got the potential to be really good. You know. Derrick is making all the right moves. The Marlins are one game back, plus 12 differential. They've won their most recent game. That's good news, folks. And their last 10 games are 4-6. and six. And the Nationals are 9-12, and 1.5 games back. Differential at negative 22. Last 10 games are 5-5. Five and five. Not great news for the Nationals. Not great news. So, Central, the Brewers, best, best team name in baseball, Brewers. 14-10, no games back. On the road, they're 9-3. and three. That's pretty good. Differential plus seven. Last ten games, six and four. Cardinals, twelve and twelve. Two games back, plus four differential. Five and five last ten games. The Cardinals are doing pretty good. I like the Cardinals. And the Pirates. The Pirates are twelve and twelve. The Pirates are uh, I was gonna say John Hopkins. Well I guess John Hopkins is Orioles team. My mom uh, went to to John Hopkins for her undergrad, and so she likes the Orioles, but she went to the Pirates game once, so uh, her favorite player was Roberto Clemente. He played for the Pirates, obviously, and she loved him. So uh, she has a affinity for them. The Pirates are twelve and twelve. They're two games back. They are seven to eight on the road. They have a differential of negative twelve. They've lost their most recent game, but they're six and six and four last ten games, which is okay, right? And plus, they have a number one overall pick this year. That's pretty good news, right? The Reds are. 11-13. Cincinnati Reds are 11-13. They are three games back of the division leader. They're 7-5 at home. They're 4-8 and eight on the road. They have a plus-6 differential. And their last 10 games, though, 2-8. and eight. Ouch. <laughs> All right. And the Cubbies. The Cubbies are... Um, they're 10-14. to 14. They are four games back. Four games back of a division leader. If you'd asked me a month ago if Cubbies, how they'd be doing, I would not have predicted they'd be doing this poorly because they should be doing better. And the problem is away. At home, they are 8-7, and seven, barely even. Away, they're 2-7. and seven. And their differential is negative 18. They've lost five games in a row. Ouch. In the NL West, of course, the Dodgers are just doing great. They're 16-9. Percentage of 640. They are 8-5 and five on the road. They're 8-5 at home. 8-4 on the road. Differential of plus 37, which is the best in big leagues. They won their most recent game, and they are 3-7 and seven over the last 10 games. So, even at 3-7 and seven over the last 10 games, the Dodgers still have an astronomically high win percentage. They're basically a monopoly at this point. Should break them up. The Giants are also 16-9. They are 10-3 at home, 6-6 six, six on the road. Differential plus 24. Last 10 games are 7-3. The Padres are 14-12, 2.5 games back of both the Dodgers and Giants. The uh, Padres have a plus 14 differential. They are 9-4 on the road. They are 5-5 five five over the last 10 games. Diamondbacks are 12-12, playing 500 ball, 3.5 games back of a division leader, plus 3 differential, 7-10 last 10 games. 
Love to see that. And the Rockies are 9-15, 6.5 games back, negative 8 differential. Jeff Bridges is gone. Hopefully they turn it around. And that concludes it for the first segment. Stick around after the break for more. Only at the GSMC Baseball Podcast. Thank you very much. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Welcome back to the GSMC Baseball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Graham Evina, and we're still talking about baseball. So we talked about the game between the Cubs and the Braves. Excellent game. We saw Freddie Freeman strike out against Anthony Rizzo, (laughs) which should never happen, but it's baseball, man. What can you say about it? So anyway, we talked briefly about standings, you know, who's doing well, who's doing what, and... We're not going to talk about statistics. Which players are doing the best right now in the league? So, across all leagues, let's talk about uh, batting average, okay? So, the leader is a guy named Yermin Mercedes, who has been tearing up the American League. So, this guy is 28 years old. He's from La Romana, Dominican Republic. And his bio, let me Google that right now. He's 5'11", 245. He's a rookie. He's a rookie, and his stats for his career looks like he has played exactly one at bat in 2020, but this is his first season, really, and so far, he's hit four home runs, in addition to his league-leading 432 batting average, which is the highest in Major League Baseball. His on-base percentage is 475, his slugging is 662, and his OPS is is 1.137 for a war of 1.2. And that's only in 74 bats. So if you do the math times like on like 6, that's that's like (laughs) 7.2. Like that's MVP level production from a catcher. Granted, I don't think it's sustainable because one of the things that happens with batting average is called batting average on balls in play, which means that if you... um, If you hit balls and you're lucky, like they're finding gaps when they shouldn't, you're playing against bad fielders, sometimes they land in a higher rate because of chance. And that's, oh, it's your batting average. And that's mistakenly attributed to skill as opposed to inherent uh, luck. So I doubt that's going to be sustainable for a long time. You can't hit 427 for your career. But he's off to a great start. And obviously, we'll be following his career with much interest. If he pulls this off, he's going to be a great story. So your mean Mercedes is leading the league in batting average. Good for him. We really appreciate that. And number two is, of course, Mike Trout. So Trout is off to the best start of his career, I'd say. Now, of course, he's so good every year we seem to be saying that, but this time we, we actually mean it. So he's batting 420 right now for his uh, year. He is, uh, let me pull some more stats up. Yeah, he's batting 420 right now. Um, he also has hit six home runs, 14 RBIs, he has stolen zero bases. I think he's done stolen bases for now. His on base is 524, slugging a 783, OPS of 1.306 for a war of 1.8. That is excellent. So, among his leaderboard stuff, his average is second. His home runs are tied for 16th. His RBI is tied for 43rd. But his OPS is 1.306, the best in baseball, all leagues. And it feels like for the last three years or so, voters have just stopped giving Trout awards. Like, it seems like voters, even though we all universally agree that he's the best player in baseball, he's only won, like, three MVP awards. He should have more. So Trout deserves the number of MVP if he keeps this up. He's off to a great start. So that's Mike Trout. That's a Trout man. Then after him, number three in the league in batting average, is a guy that 
many of you probably don't know. His name is Jesse Winker for the uh, Reds. And I was pissed off because Winker was taken one pick ahead of me in the draft for fantasy baseball that I really wanted him. I missed out on him with like one pick. I also wanted Verdugo and didn't get him either. So I'm upset because I picked some guys I shouldn't have over Winker. But yeah, he's a great player. I've always known that about him. He's 27 years old, lefty from upstate New York. And here are his stats for the first, I guess, fifth of the season. Played 19 games. He's had 77 at-bats. He's had six home runs, 15 RBIs, average of 377, on base of 422, six walks, slugging of 701, OPS of 1.123 for a war of 0.8. That's pretty good. Now, here's something that's pretty fascinating. His OPS is excellent, only a little bit behind Mike Trout, and yet he's only worth, like, Mike Trout's war is 50% better than Jesse Winker's. Why is that? Maybe defense? I know Winker's a poor defender, but I don't know. That's just probably, that's fascinating to me. So that's Jesse Winker. Uh, Great start this year. He's doing great. Number four is Yulieski Goriel in terms of batting average. So Yuli is batting 356 so far. It's my first base for the Astros. Uh, he's doing great so far. Let me pull up his stats. Remember, he is the older brother of Lourdes Goriel Jr. from the not the I think he's from the for the the Cardinals nowadays. And so Yuli is a 356. He's got four home runs, 16 RBIs. He's got an on base percentage of 456, slugging of 575, OPS of 1.031, and a WAR of Brace yourself. Are you braced? 1.5. Even better than Mike Trout. He's playing first base too. Wait, I was wrong. Turns out Mike Trout's war is 1.8. <laughs> okay, almost as good as Mike Trout's. That's pretty great too. <laughs> My entire sales pitch was just completely wrong for this episode. We'll get to war leaders in a minute. But for average, that's pretty great. I wonder if you'd sort by war on this. Yep, you can. All right, so for average, Yuli's number four. Number five is Ronald Acuna Jr. when it comes to batting average. He's batting 350 this year. 350. On base of 454, slugging of 750, OPS of 1.204, and a war of, it doesn't even say. Like, I hate when they don't tell you what the war is, so let me check it out real fast. Doesn't say. It's probably pretty good, though. Uh, but yeah, so Acuna's off to a great start this year. He's His OPS is 1.206. I'm going to say because, like, for my fantasy draft, I picked uh, Mookie Betts for number one overall. Well, it's really my teammate's decision picking pick Mookie Betts by giving him the green light. And now he's nowhere on the leaderboards anywhere. Mookie Betts is missing in action. <laughs> let, me, let me Google Mookie stats real fast. Mookie Betts statistics. All right. Yeah, this year he's batting 250 of two home runs on base of 362, uh, slugging uh, 415 on base of 774, war of 0.6. Yeah, Mookie is not doing great this season, which is like, ouch. We should have known that before we spent our number one overall pick on this guy. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, Mookie is not performing expectations. So that's batting. That's the top five guys for batting average. Now let's look at home runs. Everyone loves home runs. So best in home runs is Byron Buxton, Ryan McMahon, Reese Hoskins, and Ronald Acuna Jr. at eight home runs apiece. And that's like uh, about 40 home runs a full season if you do multiply by five. That's pretty good. Pretty good stuff. A lot of power there. Behind them at seven are guys like Nelson Cruz, Freddie Freeman, Eduardo Escobar from the Diamondbacks. Love that guy. J.D. Martinez, Nick Castellanos, Wilson Contreras, Fran Mil Reyes, Vladimir Guerrero Jr., Fernando Tatis, Shohei Otani, and Nick Solak at seven apiece. Pretty good. Yeah, Otani this year, as I mentioned, is batting 284, seven home runs, uh, 
let's see, OPS of uh, 959, war of 0.8 as a batter. That's excellent. RBIs. 22 RBIs for Jesus Aguiar for the Miami Marlins and Nate Lowe for the Texas Rangers. 22. Martinez, number three. No, I guess number two, actually. Well, no, if you got two, that's number one. Martinez is the number three at 21 RBIs. And Justin Turner is the number four of 20. So for total bases, number one is J.D. Martinez at 61. Number two is Byron Buxton at 60. Number three is Ronald Cunha Jr. at 60. Four is Nick Castellanos at 57. Five is Shohei Otani at 56. So Otani has more total bases than Mike Trout. Wow, except that Trout actually played 20 less at bats than Otani, so I guess that makes sense. All right, good deal. For walks, uh, number one is Max Muncy. See, if you'd ask me, like, who the best eye in baseball, I'd say, I don't know, like, Joey Votto or somebody. But Max Muncy is leading baseball in walks. That's pretty good. Good, good. good for him. Number two is Joey Gallo at 23. Number three is Freddie Freeman at 19. Number four is Robbie Grossman at 17. Number five is Yandy Diaz, also at 17. That's pretty good. Good company. We, we like to see that. Uh, close on their heels is Vladimir Guerrero Jr. We'll talk about more in a minute. For strikeouts, which batter is striking out the, at the highest rate? Uh, number one is Eugenio Suarez at 38 strikeouts and only 88 at-bats. That's nearly half. That's pretty bad. And his war, Eugenio's war is negative 1.1. Might be the worst in baseball. Uh, number two for strikeouts is Javier Baez at 35. Uh, Gallo's at number, at 35 strikeouts too. Matt Chapman's at 34 strikeouts. Reese Hoskins is at 33. Adam Duvall is at 32. The usual suspects. And Randy Orozarena, after being World Series hero, is at 32 strikeouts as well, although he's been playing well overall. Stolen bases. Stolen bases. Number one is Whit Merrifield. At eight stolen bases. Number two is Ramon Laureano, also at eight stolen bases. Number three is Jazz Chisholm, the Arizona transplant to Miami, who stole seven bases. Marcus Semien stole seven six bases too. And Manny Machado has stolen five bases. Pretty good. Pretty good. On base percentage. The leader on base percentage is Mike Trout at five twenty four. Now that's excellent. That is excellent stuff. Uh, getting on base more halftime, that's Barry Bonds-esque. He's done over 70 at-bats. That's pretty good. It's early, but he's off a great start. Number two is Yermin Mercedes at 475. Although, almost all of it is average-driven. Uh, like, for example, Mike Trout's average is 420. His on-base is 524. So he's, he's walking enough that it's making a difference. Mercedes is batting 432, so on base is 475. He's only walked six times this season, so that's probably making his dent. Number three in on base percentage is Vladimir Guerrero Jr. He has he's batting 346. He's walking a lot more. He's, he's 17 walks. Vladdy is doing great this season in terms of discipline. Off to a great start. Number four is Guillermo Heredia, center field, on base of 467. I wonder how old uh, Heredia is. I think he was from the Mariners. Yeah. 30 years old from the Mariners originally. But he's doing great right now. He's doing great. And number five is Nico Horner at 462. We love to see that. 462. Excellent. We love to see that. And after him, there is, um, let's see, Brandon Nimmo, 457 on base percentage. We like to see that too. And slugging. Slugging, how do you forget slugging? That's a great category, too. So it should come to no surprise to most people that uh, Mike Trout is also leading in terms of uh, slugging. <laughs> like, when you're best player to everything, you might as well just continue the trend. So Mike Trout is just doing a great job there, too. Um, he's leading the lead slugging at 783. His OPS, sorry, I should, I'll get that later. Slugging 783. Aquino Jr. slugging is at 750. And Jesse Winkers is at 701. Martinez is at 685. And Nelson Cruz is at 676. For OPS, 
The leader in OPS is Mike Trout at 1.306. Number two is Ronald Acuna Jr. at 1.204. Number three is Vladimir Guerrero Jr. at 1.14. Number four is Yarmin Mercedes at 1.137. And number five is Jesse Winker at 1.123. And for war, for war, the leader, of course, is Mike Trout at 1.8. Carson Kelly... For the Diamondbacks, our catcher, who's played in 49 at-bats, is batting, has a war of 1.6. <laughs> our Diamondbacks catcher is playing so well right now. We'd love to see that. Number three for war is Nick Solak for the Texas Rangers. 1.5 so far. He's doing excellent. Number four is Omar Narvaez, the catcher for Milwaukee. War of 1.3. And number five is Yermin Mercedes at 1.2. Not the people who expected at this point in the season. <laughs> Not the people I expected. I wonder who's doing the worst in terms of war. The worst player in baseball right now is Eugenio Suarez. He's batting 1.25. He's played 88 at-bats, a full workload. Three home runs, 38 strikeouts, 10 walks, on base of 228, slugging of 273, OPS of 500, war of negative 1.1. Ouch. Number two is uh, Daniel Robertson from the Milwaukee Brewers. He's batting 105 this season, albeit in only 40 at bats, for a war of negative 0.7. And the third worst is, because doing, doing this further than like three people is going to be pretty cruel, Jonathan Scope for the, well, you know, I'll include all three. Three players from the Detroit Tigers Jonathan Scope, Victor Reyes, and Jacoby Jones are all at negative 0.6 wins per replacement. That's really bad. <laughs> That's terrible, in fact. Um, yeah, I can't emphasize that enough. Okay, now it's for some pitching stats. We've got three minutes left in this quarter. The best pitcher in terms of war, who do you think it is? Number one is Jacob deGrom at 1.7. He's pitched five games so far, ERA of 0.51. 59 strikeouts and 35 innings. Dragons per nine of 15.2. He's just been doing excellent. Whip of 0.57. He's pitching on God mode. Number two is John Means from the Baltimore Orioles. War of 1.5. ERA of 1.50. His whip is 0.9. Dragons per nine of 8.7. He's doing great too. He's doing great. Number three is Jonathan Gray from the Rockies. He has uh, ERA of 2.54, WAR 1.5, WHIP of 1.09, and in Coors Field too. It's Coors Field. Tyler Mayo from Cincinnati is doing well as well. WAR of 1.5, WHIP of 0.97, strikeouts per nine of 12.6 for an ERA of 1.75. Then after that, there's Shane Bieber from the Indians, ERA of 2.48. Strikeouts per nine of 14.1. Whip of 0.94. War of 1.4. Excellent. Number six is Glass now. Now, Glass was on injury uh, caution. I think he pulled something last game. Six games started. Four quality starts. 1.67 ERA. 56 strikeouts. 13.4 strikeouts per nine. War of 1.4. And a whip of 0.8. Excellent job. Then there's Danny Duffy at uh, (laughs) four quality starts, 0.39 ERA, 10.6 strikeouts per nine, war of 1.3. Excellent job. Uh, Yeah, great pitching this season. This is the year of the pitcher for sure. The year of the pitcher, no doubt about it. I wonder who's doing the worst. Uh, I know I picked up, hang on, Ian Anderson. I wonder how he's doing. Um... Yeah, he's doing great. I made a good call there. Herman Marquez, I wonder how he's doing. Yeah, the guys I picked are all doing good. <laughs> all right, the worst pitch in terms of war is Alex Colome from the Twins, a reliever who has pitched in nine games, an ERA of 8.31, which is just wow. Like, that's unbelievable almost. And, um, yeah, I can't say anything about that. Uh, war of negative 1.5. A whip of 1.96. And Patrick Corbin 
for the for the Nationals starting pitcher, Patrick Corbin, ex Diamondback. He started four games. His ERA is ten point four seven for a WAR of negative zero point nine. <coughs> That's pretty bad. And then there's finally Jose Quintana for the uh, Angels, pitched in thirteen innings, uh, ten point one three ERA. Charts per nine of 12.8. That's pretty good, but a war of negative 0.8. That's tough. After the break, we'll talk about recaps, more facts and figures, more games played, more finals, more results. Only at the GSNC Baseball Podcast. Thank you very much. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Baseball Podcast. I'm Graham Yavina, and we're still talking baseball. Last time around, we talked about the Cubs and the Braves. We talked about top performers, talked about guys who weren't doing so hot. And now we're talking about the other events from around the league, April 28th. Let's do this. So, next game up is the Twins and the Indians. The Twins and the Indians. You know, I, let, let me take a look again how both teams are doing right now. The Twins are 8-15. and 15. And the Indians are 11 and 12, so both teams could clearly be doing better. The Twins have a lot of explaining to do, a lot of explaining to do. So let's take a look at the box score real fast. And we open it up. Guess who's pitching on the mound for the Twins? It's uh, J. A. Happ, the former Yankee. He's back playing for the Twins. And for the Indians, it's a man named Logan Allen. Logan Allen. I seem to remember that he was like a two-way player at one point. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but he's 23 years old. He's from West Palm Beach, Florida. Good for him. Probably a rookie, right? He's probably pretty young. Uh, yeah, so he's playing day for the Indians. Now, batting for the Indians, uh, center field is Byron Buxton, who is off to a scorching start. We love Byron Buxton in this household. He's doing great. Then after him, there was uh, playing third base, Josh Donaldson. He's playing third base, the ageless wonder. He's still out there. DHing is Nelson Cruz. Still, he's out there. Uh, second base is Jorge Polanco. Catcher is Mitch Garver. Right field is Brent Rooker. First base is Williams Ostadio, who pitched recently. He actually pitched as a position player in a game recently. He's throwing like 40 miles an hour, but doing a great job. Love to see that here. Shortstop is. And by the way, Williams is like five foot nine. Yeah, playing first base, that's pretty rare. Uh, after him, at I believe it was... Cat, no, shortstop is Andrelton Simmons. Simba. Left field is Alex Kirilov. And that was the team for the uh, for the tw- Minnesota Twins this afternoon. For the Indians, second base is Cesar Hernandez. Center field is Jordan Luplau. Third base is Jose Ramirez. First base, Jake Bowers. DH is Fran Mil Reyes. Left field is Eddie Rosario. Shortstop is Ahmed Rosario. No relation. Right field is the Canadian Josh Naylor. First base is Yu Chen Cheng. He's from, I believe, Taiwan. Yep, he's from Tianan, Taiwan. Good for him. Young man making it out here in the big world. Catcher is Austin Hedges, the best defensive catcher in the game. Probably. Except for Jeff Mathis. He's pretty good, too. And... Um, now some talk about who did what. So, 
First of all, the Twins won the game 10-2. You know what? Let me first tell you who won each game. I'm out of time all enough to go through all the teams, so the Twins won the last game 10-2 against the Indians. The Marlins won against the Brewers 6-2. The Reds lost against... The Dodgers won. The Reds lost 8 to nothing uh, in Dodger Stadium. Kershaw's on the bump. For the Royals, they won 9 to nothing over the Pirates. Sorry, 9 to 6, my bad. The Red Sox won a gem 1 to nothing over the Mets. The Yankees won 7 to nothing over the Orioles. The Nationals won 8 to 2 over the Blue Jays. And the Athletics won or lost, sorry, the Rays won 2 to nothing over the A's. Uh the Phillies won 5 to 3 over the Cardinals. The Angels won 4 to 3 over the, Tex- the Texas Rangers. The Astros won 7 to 5 over the Mariners. The Padres beat the Diamondbacks 12 to 3. We can just skip that one. <laughs> the Giants won 7 to 3 against the Rockies. And that's it for the teams. All right, so now we've gotten over that. Let's go over some select games. So the Minnesota Twins and the Cleveland Indians. Let's go by play by play. So uh, Logan Allen was picking for the Cleveland Indians. And in the top of first inning, Byron Buxton hit a home run off him. Leadoff home run, second pitch of the game. He threw a belt high fastball, sliding inside. Buxton cranked it to right field. Opposite field home run, 350 feet. Good for him. After that was Josh Donaldson playing against him. He had a home run to left field, went 423 feet. Good for him. Then Polanco hit a home run, two run home run to left center field, driving himself and Nelson Cruz. 4 0 Minnesota Twins. Top second inning. Against uh, Stefan, uh, Cruz hits a single to deep right field, drives in Buxton, drives in Kirilov, and that's Donaldson. The Twins are up 6 to nothing. Then, batting second and bomb second inning, Jay Happs pitching. Ahmed Rosario, it's home run to right field. Now the gap is lessened from 6 to nothing, 6 to 1 for the Twins. Then Ostadio, Williams Ostadio hits a home run to left field. One of my favorite players. Gap increases 7 to 1. Ostadio. First pitch wing gets a slider, uh, lone inside, pulls a home run to left field. Good for him. Top of fifth inning, uh, Mitch Garvitz home run to left field against uh, Pat Henches. That's 8-1 to one for the Twins. Then in the bottom of fifth inning, Jay Happs pitching. Yu Chen Cheng uh, drives in on the Rosario for ground ball. Top of seventh inning, Garner hits home run to left field. <coughs> I just need <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, Garner hits home run to left field. Polanco scores. And that's it, 10-2 for the Twins. Good job, Twins. Excellent excellent win on the road. Then the Marlins playing against the Brewers. The Marlins win 6-2. Let's go over that right now. So, box score. Uh, playing for the uh, Marlins that game. Taking forever to load. Let's see how that goes. <laughs> All right, so pitching for the Marlins was Sandy Alcantara. He was playing. Seven innings pitch, two hundred runs allowed. Good job for him. For the Brewers, it was Zach Godley. And this game, the umpire made a baffling call when he said that, uh, you know, there's, at one point, Godley, someone hits a ground ball to him. He tries to tag out the runner. Uh, he throws the ball at first base. And the umpire called it interference, even though it seemed in my eyes, at least, that it wasn't. John Boy over on YouTube made a great video about this. It was clearly not what it appeared to be, but umpire made a bad call. So, yeah, Sandy Alcantara's pitching on the mound for the Marlins. Zach Godley, the former Diamondback from Kentucky, was playing for the Brewers. And you know, I like him a lot. He didn't pitch well for us last year, but it doesn't matter. We hope he's going to do fine. And then uh, also for the Mar- for the Brewers was Brad Boxberger. Uh, was good with us. He's playing for the Brewers again. Anyway, for the Marlins, they had Miguel Rojas at short. Jesus Aguiar at first base. Gary Cooper in right field. Lewis Brinson uh, and Corey Dickerson sharing time in left field. Uh, Adam Duvall in center field, Isan Diaz in second base, John Birdie at third base, Chad Wallach a catcher. And for the uh, Brewers, second base, they had Colton Wong. Actually, it might be Keon Wong. Let me check. No, it's Colton Wong, the older one. He's uh, playing second base for the Brewers. Then there's Dan Vogelbach at first base. Then there's Omar Narvaez a catcher. Then there's Travis Shaw at third base. Uh, good for him. Then there was... Uh, Tyrone Taylor in right field. Then Billy McKinney in left field. Jackie Bradley Jr. at center. Luis Erdi at shortstop. And, of course, Zach Godley on the bump. So let's do let's do play-by-play. Play. Uh, top scoring plays. So in the top of second inning, um, this is the play I was telling you guys about. 
top of second. Dickerson uh, scores on error, and then Diaz is safe at first base on interference by the pitcher Godley, the umpire said, which clearly was not true. Barry gets second base. So that was the uh, incident from that uh, game, and that put the Marlins up by one run. Bomb third inning, uh, oh, sorry, in the same inning, there was wild pitch and Barry scores. So the Marlins are up two to nothing. In the bottom of third inning, the Brewers are uh, batting, and Colton Wong gets two-run home run, drives in himself and Jackie Bradley Jr. Tie game two two. Then the Marlins take place again, top of fourth inning. Uh, Eric Yardley's pitching on the mound for the Brewers. Jesus Aguiar hits home run to left field, drives three-run home run, drives in himself, Diaz and Rojas five two Marlins. Then top of fifth inning, with Yardley still pitching. Wallach gets a single to right field and drives in Sierra, uh, Magnari Sierra, 6-2 Marlins, and that's where the game ends. Good job, Marlins. They won the game, clean, fair, uh, lots of scoring that game. Uh, now we're moving on to the Dodgers and the Reds. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. I'm counting the number of games we have left to go, so I don't run out of time here. Uh, coming up next after that is the uh, Reds and the Dodgers. So if we go over here. Let me open this game up real fast. Yep. So let me open up the box score. Excellent. Great. So on the bump for the Reds was Sonny Gray. Uh, he had a great game today. Good for him. But unfortunately, uh, Clayton Kershaw was even better than that. So Kershaw had a gem. Seven innings pitched. Eight strikeouts. 2.09 ERA. Excellent job. No complaints there. And... Uh, I believe Danny Santana, no, Dennis Santana, somebody else, came in to relieve him. Okay. Uh, for the Reds, Sonny Gray had a great game, too. Really, both starters pitched well. Uh, for the Reds, uh, it looks like uh, playing for the uh, in center field was Nick Senzel. Uh, he went 4 4 today. Great job. Then Jesse Winkers in left field. Then Nick Castellanos is at right field. Joey Votto's at first base. Uh, Eugenio Suarez at shortstop. Mike Moustakas at third base. Tyler Stevenson's a catcher. Cal Farmer's second base. Um, and that's it for the time being. For the Dodgers, Mookie Betts is playing center field. Gavin Lux is playing shortstop. Justin Turner's playing third base. Max Muncy is playing first base. He's leading the lead in walks right now, by the way. Uh, Chris Taylor's at second base. A.J. Pollock in left field. Luke Rayleigh in right field. Austin Barnes, a catcher. And that's how the game looks. So play by play, let's go ahead and open it up. Scoring plays. So Gray's pitching, bomb second inning. Uh, Grayley grabs into a double play. Uh, four, six, three. Uh, but Pollock uh, is out second base, but Taylor scores. So Dodgers are up one to nothing. And bomb third inning. Uh, Justin Turner hits a home run off him. Solo shot, two nothing Dodgers. The game is quiet for the next five innings. And then, of course, Sonny Gray comes out. They put in Sal Romano to put the pitch for Cincinnati. Um, early on, uh, Taylor's batting. On a sinker off of Sal Romano, he triples deep right field, drives in Justin Turner. Then Pollock singles to left center and drives in Taylor. Now Dodgers are up 4 nothing. Then Brett Beatty singles left field and drives in both Pollock and Rayleigh. So now the Dodgers are up 6 0. Then Betts, Mookie, gets single at center field, and there's an error on the play. And so Barnes and Beats score on the same error uh, by Tyler Nake when he makes a throwing error. So that was the game 8 0 Dodgers. Uh, kind of messy at the end there, but they won the game fair and square. Then there's the Royals and the Pirates. Let's open that back up. So the uh, Royals are pitching Mike Myers on the bump for the Kansas City team. For Pirates, they've got Mitch Keller. Both starters have a lot of potential. They haven't really shown the season. Miner's got an ERA of 5.26. Keller's got one of 8.2. Uh, tough. Really tough. For the uh, clubs themselves, the Royals are now 15-8. and eight. They're doing great. The Pirates are 12-12. and 12. For the Royals, at second base, there's Whit Merrifield. Uh, first base, there's Carlos Santana. Catcher, there is Salvador Perez. Right field, there is Jorge Soler. Uh, left field is Andrew Benintendi. Third base was Hunter Dozier. Uh, center field, I believe that's, uh, let me check, Michael Taylor. 
Yep, from the Nationals. He's playing center field for the Royals now. Uh, shortstop, there's Nicky Lopez. He, I believe, is from... No, he's from Illinois. I he's from Puerto Rico, but he's from Illinois. And for the uh, Pirate squad, second base is Adam Frazier. Left field is Philip Evans. Center field is Brian Reynolds. Um, third base is uh, Todd Frazier. Shortstop uh, is Eric Gonzalez. Catcher is Jacob Stallings. Wilmer Defoe is in right field. Kevin Newman played both shortstop and second base in this game. He's from Arizona, actually. I'd like to see that. And, yeah, uh, that's basically it. Uh, pitching at some point was a guy named Kai Tom. He's from uh, Hawaii. Uh, not many of those guys around anymore, so that's good to see. Uh, now, let's, let's go over play-by-play real fast. So, uh, scoring plays, of course. Top of the first inning, Keller's pitching for Pittsburgh. Soler drives in Carlos Santana with a double. Dozier triples the center field. Triples. Drives in both Soler and Benintendi. Rolls up 3 nothing. Then, in top third inning, uh, Taylor walks. Perez scores. Dozier goes second base. Benintendi goes third base on a base loaded walk by Poppin of the Pirates. 4 nothing Royals. Then, top the fourth inning, Perez hits a single to deep right field. Drives in both Whit Merrifield and Carlos Santana. 6 nothing Royals. Then, above fourth inning, the uh, Pirates strike back. So Gonzalez and Stallings have back-to-back home runs. Uh, the first one was a two-run shot. The second one was a solo shot. 6-3 to three Royals. Then, in the next thing, bomb fifth inning, Todd Frazier hits a two-run double to right field. So now the score is 6-5. to five, Royals up by one. Top of sixth inning, though. Top of sixth inning. So Larry hits a double to right field, drives in Whit Merrifield. The Benteni hits a double of his own and drives in Santana. And Solera, too. So now it's 9-5 to five Royals. The Pirate squad scores a run in the bottom of the eighth inning, but it doesn't matter. Royals win the game 9-6. to six. Josh Stallman gets a save. Uh, he's from Azusa Pacific University. Good on him. After that, let's go over the Red Sox and the Mets. Good game. Good game. Now, this is my favorite because the game was 1-0. And, and I like games that are low-scoring affairs. I think I learned more from that. So, low-scoring affair... Red Sox are coming into this game 16-9. Mets are 9-10. Let's see how it turns out. For the Red Sox, pitching on the bump was the Canadian Nick Pavetta. Uh, pitching for the Mets was Jacob deGrom. So you're thinking deGrom, right? Uh, no. In this game, Pavetta sort of outpitched him. So Pavetta pitched five innings, gave up no earned runs, only one hit, seven strikeouts. deGrom pitched six innings, three hits, one earned run, and nine strikeouts. So... Uh, Pavetta's ERA is now 2.81. DeGrom's ERA is 0.51. But DeGrom got the loss today. Ouch. <laughs> I mean, DeGrom is just a hard luck guy. He, all, this year, he just has no run support. So for the Red Sox, playing for them was Kike Hernandez in, right, in center field. Uh, right field was Alex Verdugo. Uh, left field is J.D. Martinez. Shortstop is Xander Bogarts. Third base is Rafael Devers. Catcher is Christian Vasquez. Se- second base is, I believe, is Marwin Gonzalez. Yeah, that's him. Uh, first base is Bobby Dalbeck. Uh Dalbeck is uh, 25 years old. He's from Seattle. Good hitter. Plays third base, too, mostly. So that's good to see that. Hit a home run this game, I believe. Hit a home run this game. And, uh, yeah, uh, for the Mets, center field is Brandon Nimmo. He's from Wyoming. Uh it's- so, fun story about him. When he was in high school, he didn't even his own high school didn't have a baseball team, so he had to go to scouts and try out at Perfect Game and stuff. And that's how he got scouted, but he did not have a high school baseball team. So that was kind of funny. Um, good player, like him. Then shortstop is uh, Francisco Lindor, who this year is not been playing well. He's batting 203 this season, which is like, ouch. After the Mets traded the entire system for him, he's responding fairly... Uh, you know, with, with mediocrity, he's not doing great. Two or three batting average. Uh, first base is Peter Alonso. Right field is the villain from last week, Michael Conforto. Remember, Conforto was a guy who leaned into the pitch, who took his elbow out to get hit by the ball, which is ouch. Um, you know, we don't want to see that, but he's playing today. Then after that, uh, third base is J.D. Davis. Left field is Dominic Smith. I always get Dominic Smith and Dwight Smith confused, but Dominic Smith's playing left field. 
He's really first baseman, but he's playing left field out of convenience now. Out of deference for Peter Alonso. Uh, that's great. Then second base is Jeff McNeil. Catcher is Jeff McCann. Uh, actually, sorry, John McCann, I believe. Jesus Christ. James McCann. James McCann. Uh, from California. <laughs> God, that's embarrassing. Then pitching, of course, was the DeGrominator, Jacob DeGrom, from Lakeland, Florida. Here's play-by-play. Scoring plays, of course. So, the only score that happened all game long is when Christian Vasquez, the catcher, top six inning with runner on first base. Bogertz is on, is on first base. So, first pitch, DeGrom throws fastball, 98 miles an hour, high and side, foul ball. Second pitch, 99 miles an hour for a swinging strike. Then, on third pitch, DeGrom throws a 100-mile-an-hour fastball out of the zone above at the letters, and Vasquez hits a two-run double, sorry, a one-run double, and drives in Bogarts from first base. That's the only run of the game, Red Sox win. That's baseball for you. After the break, we'll talk a little bit more about these uh, recaps and some funny stories from the dugout. Stay tuned for more, only at the GSMC Baseball Podcast. Thank you very much. Want to know the latest in soccer? Then listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. From MLS, the World Cup, and the Premier League, we've got you covered. The latest updates, the hottest matches, and news on the league's top players. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. David Beckham scores the goal. Listen now. Welcome back to the GSMC Baseball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Channel. I'm your host and your best friend, Grammy Vina, and tonight we're talking about baseball. So here's a story. I could go over to some more contemporary stuff, but first let me tell you some stories. I'm just jumping the gun. I want to gossip. So we're going back to the 1930s, and there's this book that I'm reading out loud from called uh, Baseball Anecdotes, funnily enough, by Daniel Okrent, and where all my material from <laughs> so there's some good stories i want to share with you so uh let's see let me try to find one <laughs> all right here here i got i got one going on so there's a guy named zeke bonura who was from the 1930s and he was an incredible hitter if you look him up you'll find that he was a talented hitter he knew to swing the bat but uh as the book says, his 307 lifetime average was all the more impressive for someone who was <laughs> was all the more impressive for his panel first Jesus Christ, let me try this again. <laughs> Zeke Bonier was a pure hitter whose 307 lifetime average was all the more impressive for his painful slowness as a runner and as a thinker. Playing in Chicago for Jimmy Dykes, who called him my pet ox. Bonura often stood uncomprehending outside the batter's box, unable to fathom the signs handed out from uh, third base. So when you play baseball, third base coach usually gives you signs, and you read the signs, and you know to bunt or to hit and run or to steal a base, that kind of thing. So Bonura often forgot the signs. So he's standing outside the box one time, uncomprehendingly looking at the coach's signs. And one occasion... Dykes become so exasperated that he just starts yelling out to Bunyura, Bunt, you meathead. Bunt. Bunt. B-U-N-T. Bunt. And he just starts yelling that from the dugout. Uh, no salty there. And after Bunyura was traded to the Senders for 1938, the White Sox didn't even bother to change their signs for their first series against Washington. So Dykes told uh, his coach, Bing Miller, why should you change your signs? He couldn't remember them when he was with us, so why would he remember them if he was not playing for us anymore? But when Bonura, leading off from third, saw Dykes just absentmindedly swing his his uh, scorecard towards a uh, mosquito or something, which was a sign back then for stealing, 
he unexpectedly rumbles towards home. He runs towards home and uh, crashes in the catcher, separates the ball, and scores a run. Afterwards, Bunyard explained to his dash, his only stolen base in 19 years. I saw Dykes give a sign to steal, and I forgot I wasn't on his team anymore. <laughs> so that's how it all worked out. Just kind of a funny story. Um, yeah, so here's a good story. So Johnny Vandermeer. Uh, Johnny Vandermeer was the only guy who ever threw back-to-back no-hitters, which uh, has never happened before. So he threw a no-hitter one day. His next start, he threw another no-hitter, and that's never been happened before again. So, in the first night game in Ebbets Field, that Johnny uh, Vandermeer threw his second consecutive no-hitter, he barely made it. It happened on June 15th, 1938, and he barely made it. To the first batter in the ninth inning, Buddy Hassett, he threw three wild pitches in a row before getting him out on ground ball. Then he walked Bave Phelps. Then he walked... Cookie Lavaghetto. And after loading the bases, he walked Dolph Camilli on four pitches. He still had a 6 to nothing lead. And the manager, Bill McKenzie, was going to probably let Vandermeer keep, keep going until he score 6-5. to five, Which is such a departure from now. Like, Dave Roberts can't wait to pull you from the game if you've got no hitter going on. Like, he just can't wait to do it. If, for him, it's all about winning games. Throwing a no-hitter is a bonus, but if... Getting a, a win is jeopardized by that. He pulls you. And that's the standard nowadays. No one cares about no-hitters anymore. They pull you re- immediately for no reason. And back then, the philosophy was different. It was, if you have no-hitter, that's more important than the game. So, Vandermeer walks base loaded. He walks after that, 6-1. to one. Um, Whatever, right? The manager isn't going to budge yet. And then, he gets Ernie Coy, the batter, on a fielder's choice. Uh, and there was two outs at the top in the bottom ninth inning. Base is still loaded. And also in the way was Leo DeRocher, the guy who eventually became manager in his own right. And I believe that uh, DeRocher is a Hall of Famer. Uh, we counted two strikes. Vandermeer threw a pitch that, that he thought was a strike, but the umpire called a ball. So now the umpire blew a call, right? And that's bad news for Vandermeer, who is now fading. So DeRocher finally made the game ending out. And a celebration began. The umpire came to the mound. Uh, John, the umpire said, I blew that pitch. If you hadn't gotten him out, I was the guy to blame for it. Said Vandermeer to Donald Honing, the historian, 40 years later. If DeRocher got on the base hit, would he still have said that? <laughs> um, and here's one. So, Ernie Lombardi, the catcher I mentioned in the last podcast episode, he was a catcher for the Cincinnati Reds for many years. Hall of Famer. 50 wins by replacement. One of the best of all time. And his hands were so big that he could hold seven balls in one of them at any given point. So there's a picture of Ernie Lombardi holding like seven baseballs in his right hand and his catcher's mitt on the other hand. And I could never do that. I could hold like maybe four. And I've got big hands too, big fingers, but he's just got a big palm. He could do seven baseballs. So... He ran so slowly that at one point he was thrown out of first base on a line drive hit off the left field wall. So he has a line drive off the wall and gets thrown at first base anyway, which is just incredible. His huge nose uh, gave him the nickname Schnoz, and it made him such a snorer, like a snore, that his teammate Bill Rigney said the entire train would shake at night. From his snoring. But what made him famous was his hitting prowess. So he had a 46 ounce baseball bat, which was big at the time. And it would he would just crush baseball off of it. He was a good hitter. And if he had any foot speed at all, he'd he would have won more than just two batting championships in his lifetime. Opponents played him so deep that Lombardi himself once said it took him four seasons to find out that Pee Wee Reese was an infielder. Uh Arthur Daly once wrote when you look back on him in his 17 years in the big leagues, you almost come to the conclusion that he was greatest hitter of all time. But praise for uh, for Lombardi uh, didn't make up the fact that he was ridiculed a lot. After his career was over, he attempted suicide in 1953. He later on worked as a box attendant for San Francisco, and in 1974, he uh, was like the Hall of Fame eventually. 
So happy ending for him. And he eventually uh, lived out his life peacefully and blissfully. So good for him. Um, after that, let me try to find out... Um, Oh, here's a good story. So, this is about uh, Ted Williams. So, uh, so Ted Williams' mother was not a fan of his baseball abilities. So, when he was young, Ted Williams was the greatest hitter of all time, right? He was one of the best hitters of all time. And she would often um, watch Ted play baseball, and she always disapproved because she felt it was too violent for him. And his first offer to play baseball came from a semi-pro team sponsored by the Texas Liquor House. Ted Williams' first baseball team that paid him any money was from the Texas Liquor House. As Williams told John Underwood, the writer, I came home one day and told my mother about the money, and she said that was fun. And then she asked me, well, who will you play for? And I said, uh, the Texas Liquor House? If I had said Murder, Inc., I wouldn't have gotten a quicker refusal. <laughs> So that was great. <laughs> and uh, and William's pro career began with the San Diego Padres of the Pacific Coast League in 1936. The team was trailing by 10 runs in the game when he volunteered to pitch. So his first ever experience playing pro ball was as a pitcher. The manager, Frank Schellenbach, a former player, put the six foot three, 148 pound Wow, skinny boy. You into the game as a pinch hitter. And he doubled the first time up. He then got through one inning on the mound unscathed. But the second time up around, as a better, he doubled. But the next inning as a pitcher, he got shelled and gave up like 12 runs. <laughs> and when Schoenbeck came in to relieve him, the young man, Williams, said, Skip, I think you got me playing the wrong position. So from the next day on, he was a left fielder exclusively. And that's where legend began. Playing for the Texas Liquor House and starting as a pitcher. <laughs> and um, here's a great story, too. So, in 1941, Williams hit 406, the last man to hit 400 over a full season. And no batter has ever done it since. Uh, for the t- first two weeks in the next year, 1942, he was injured. He had a small hamstring injury, so he couldn't play, play starting game. So Williams decided to get more exercise, more work in against a player on his own team that he couldn't hit as well. So there's a guy named Joe Dobson, a pitcher on the Red Sox. And Williams could not hit Dobson very well. Dobson, as Williams said, had one, well, I can't say that word on the podcast anymore, one heck of a curveball and a good fastball. And he always bore down. Uh, every day, his arm held out. And blisters on my hand held out. We go out to like, a, like an all-out war between two of us. Guys, that noise in the background is my cat just chewing on like a cardboard box somewhere. I don't know why she's doing that, but that's the noise. So Williams basically got this guy to throw him batting practice every single day for two weeks. The guy he couldn't hit at all. And by the end of it, uh, he said that he was as sharp as he ever been. He said that he could see the ball well, and for him, it got a lot better from that. So that was Williams' perseverance at play there. Uh, let's do some more stuff. After that, uh, 1941, 1941, the Dodgers are playing against the Cardinals uh, in the pennant race. So back then, there was no wild card, no division series, nothing like that. It was a pennant race, which means that... Um, you know, like, there was only one winner. Like, the National League had a best team, and American League won the best team, and they played against each other, and that was it. No no wild cards, no divisions, just two teams in the Fall Classic. So the games meant more back then. There was no do-overs. And so um, one game, uh, Freddie, Freddie Fitzsimmons is pitching. And he was a guy who was a knuckleballer. His name was Fat Freddie Fitzsimmons. Look him up. Um, and he was playing for the Dodgers. He's facing the Cardinals, and... The Cardinals had a batter named Johnny Mize, who was a Hall of Famer. So, uh, in the first game, in the top of the ninth inning, score tied, Fitzsimmons is on the mound, facing against Johnny Mize, the cleanup hitter for the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, the first pitch, Fitzsimmons throws a knuckleball, and Al Barlick, the umpire, calls it a ball that Fitzsimmons thought was a strike. So Fitzsimmons runs in there and starts arguing, right? 
So in the heat of argument, Fitzsimmons turns around and sees Mize just kind of grinning at him, like smirking. Then uh, Fitzsimmons stops arguing with the umpire, turns to Mize, and says, three straight fastballs, and you're out of there. Now here's a kicker. Fitzsimmons is a knuckleballer. His fastballs stink, like he can't throw over yard. So uh, Mize doubted the pitcher was telling the truth because Fitzsimmons was out of his prime, not in good shape physically. He was overweight. He's fat free, right? Uh, and he was relying almost exclusively on a knuckleballer, uh, on knuckleball. But the first pitch was a fastball, and Mize led pass for a strike. So strike one, right? One to one count. Then another fastball, also for a strike. And Mize now reasoned that this was time for Fritz for Fitzsimmons to throw a knuckleball. But instead, there was another fastball, and Mize was flat footed. He struck out. <laughs> Embarrassing. And Dodgers won the game eventually in the 11th inning. Um, and here is a, pr- a pretty sad story I want to share with you. So, the golden age of baseball lasted from the early 20s to 1947, roughly. It was basically the era of Babe Ruth. The golden age of baseball that filled years between the wars did not end until several years later, until the death of Babe Ruth. Although he was never told of diagnosis, Babe Ruth was discovered to have cancer in 1946. Sunday, April 27, 1947, it was declared Babe Ruth Day all throughout baseball. 60,000 people appeared in Yankee Stadium to honor the Bambino, who was dressed in his familiar camel's hair, hair coat and war cap but looked and sounded very different from the man that he was famous for. He looked almost gaunt now. He had a hoarse voice, and it was hushed. He said to Mike and said, Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You know how bad my voice sounds? Well, it feels just as bad. Ruth went through a brief period of remission, but he again fell ill in 1948. He came back to the stadium one last time on June 13th for the 25th anniversary of the house that Ruth built, which was a name given to the old Yankee Stadium. He was helped into his uniform by his male nurse and posed with the other 1923 Yankees, the, the team 25 years ago that christened the new stadium. He stood in the middle of the group, with Joe Dugan placing his hands on one Ruth's shoulders and Wally Pipp placing his hand on the other. Ruth was the last player introduced to the crowd, and the writer, W.C. Hines, wrote, He walked out into the cauldron of sound he must have known better than any other man. After a short speech, Ruth walked back into the clubhouse and was soon joined by Dugan. How are things? Dugan asked him. Ruth turned to him and said, Joe, I'm gone. He said, Ruth, I'm gone, Joe. And both men started to cry. Um, at Ruth's funeral, Dugan and Wade Hoyt were two of the pallbearers. It was a very hot day, and Hoyt uh, just remarked that he could, he could use a beer. And Dugan replied, so could the babe. That same day, the old writer Tommy Holmes said to Red Smith, Some 20 years ago, I stopped talking about the babe Ruth for the simple reason that I realized that those who could ne- who, who did not see him couldn't believe me. It could have been an epitaph for entire era, right? So that was Babe Ruth. And I wanted to uh, explain another story here for you. Uh, this one's later. It's about uh, Stan Musial. So Stan Musial was one of the best heroes of all time. We all know that. Uh, before Willie Mays in his first appearance with the Cardinals when he was a rookie, Leo DeRocher, his manager, ran down the St. Louis batting order and explained to the rookie how various hitters should be played. He described the leadoff guy, the number two guy, and then moved to the number four guy. So then Willie Mays asked him about Stan Musial. And then the, the third hitter, DeRocher explained, is Stan Musial. There is no advice I can give you about that guy. <laughs> Good story. So here's another one that's about uh, financial advice. So Bobby Bragan was managing the Dodgers farm team in Port in Fort Worth, Texas, under Branch Rickey, the general manager of the Dodgers, his instructions to economize, to save money. At one point, he gets a telegram from Rickey asking, 
do you need a shortstop or can you go of your present infield? Brigham wrote back a one-word reply. Yes. Then Ricky wrote another wire saying, yes, what? And Reagan responded, yes, sir. <laughs> I've had those experiences myself too. Uh, and we need one more story. We need one more story. And try to think of one that I can tell you that's going to make it in 45 seconds or less. All right, here's one. So, um... <laughs> Johnny Bench was one of the greatest catchers of all time, right? And actually knew his uh, great nephew, like his his great nephew, Kobe Bench, went to uh, elementary school with me. We're good friends. And um, after his first full season in the big leagues, the 21-year-old Johnny Bench approached Ted Williams in spring training with a baseball in his hand and asked him, would you please autograph this for me, sir? Williams did and wrote on top of it, to Johnny Bench, a Hall of Famer for sure. And that's all time I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for watching the GSMC Baseball Podcast. It's a pleasure joining you this week. Have a great day and stay safe. Watch some baseball this weekend. Thank you very much. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Baseball Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also find Follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.